If you wanted an electric car these days, pretty much every manufacturer that you can think of will have something to offer you. You walk into your local Ford showroom, and of course there's the Mustang Mach-E. Um, Vauxhall, they give you the, the Corsa-E and the Mocha-E, and of course Peugeot and Citroen, their Stellantis brothers, are exactly the same. BMW, they offer a plethora of cars to think about, the, the, the iX1, the iX3, the iX, the i4, and of course they've had the i3 on sale for many, many years. Mercedes, exactly the same with their EQ range. I mean, there's pretty much all shapes and sizes available to you. And that's before we start talking about the Volkswagen Group, with the ID3, the ID4, the ID5, Skoda's Enyaq, and Audi Q4 e-tron, and big e-tron. And then, of course, there's things like Nissan, with the Aria, and the Leaf, and Honda with the E. And then there's the Koreans. We're talking about Hyundai with the original Ionic and now the new Ionics, the Ionic 5, the forthcoming Ionic 6 and the little corner that's about to be revised. And then there's Kia with the, the Nero and then the Soul. But one name seems to have been missing from all of that list. And it's the biggest name in the business. It's the world's biggest car manufacturer, Toyota. Well, that's about to change because now there's this the brand new, snappily titled Toyota BZ4X. So, welcome to this week's road test review. Welcome to the new Toyota BZ4X. And as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we go on with this week's road test review of the new Toyota BZ4X, it is of course that time when I ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. Once you've watched it, if you enjoy it, make sure you do give it a thumbs up and obviously leave us your comments down below as always. Let us know your thoughts on the cars that we review and the channel as a whole. So why has it taken Toyota so long to come out with a fully electric vehicle, given the fact that for decades now they've given us the Prius, which was probably the original and most, probably the biggest selling hybrid of them all? Well, it's quite simply this. Toyota don't particularly believe that the electric car is the whole answer to the, the problems that the world faces. Now, if you're a regular viewer at Auto EV, you'll know that we're not sitting here saying, beating the environmental drum, saying that electric cars are the answer, but we know that they're going to be part of the solution. And we're all petrol heads. So I can kind of see what Toyota are coming from. Now, years ago, they did do a RAV4 electric, but it's probably one of the world's best kept secrets. And it wasn't available in the UK. I think it was just for the American market that I seem to remember they did it. And they do actually give us an electric car in the sense of the Toyota Mirai, but that's a fuel cell car, so it's limited in, in its sales by the lack of a refueling network. This is a proper all-electric battery electric vehicle rather than a fuel cell car. And given the fact that this country is moving towards a full-scale shift away from the internal combustion engine, this is an important car for them. But what is the BZ4X? Well, surprise, surprise, it's a mid-sized crossover SUV competing with every other mid-sized crossover SUV, such as the Nissan Aria, Skoda Enyaq, and the Kia EV6, and etc, etc, etc. It only comes in one battery size, but you do get the choice of either a single motor or a dual motor all-wheel drive version. It's priced between £46,000 and £56,000, depending on the specification, and it has a range between 257 and 317 miles, again, depending on that chosen specification. But is it any good, and is it worthy of your consideration? Well, the only way that that question can be answered is by putting it through the road test that actual car buyers trust to deliver the true verdict on all the new electric vehicles in the UK. And that is, of course, the Auto EV one. So another road test review and another mid-sized family crossover. Is it practical for you? Well, yeah, it is actually, in fairness. You've got, as well as a very noisy boot, 452 litres of boot space in here. Now, that puts it ahead of the Ford Mustang Mach-E on a par with the Nissan Aria, but it does trail the likes of the Kia EV6, Hyundai Onyx 5 and the Gargantuan Skoda Enyaq by quite a bit. But in fairness to the Toyota, 
it is quite a nice usable space. Good wide opening, very kind of squared off in its sort of like its layout. What I do like about it is you've got a completely flat load entry. So if you're loading luggage in or a pram or a wheelchair, for instance, you're not dropping heavier items down into a well that you've got to lift back over them. So it's this nice flat entry into there. Also as well, you have a 60-40 split rear seat. And when you lay that rear seat down, like I will now, it pretty much folds flat. So you've got a nice flat bay all the way through. Now, regular viewers will know that we normally have the four suitcase test on the Auto V, and regular viewers will now see that I only have three suitcases because my brother-in-law has stolen my large suitcase to go on holiday. I think we all know what Michael's getting for his Christmas this year. But the four suitcases will fit, and they will go in quite easily because you get your suitcases in there. Our carry-ons go neatly in there. And even with just my camera bag sitting there, you can see there's plenty of room for another suitcase down the side there. So all well and good. There's other nice little touches around it as well. You've got the little kind of hooks that fold down as well on either side so you can carry shopping bags or, or such like as that. And there's some good cable storage as well because the boot floor lifts up to store all your cables in which is nice and easy in there. The other thing that you can do, which I really like, it's a real bugbear of mine. If you're like me and you go to the tip on a Sunday, when I go in my car, I've got to take the shelf, the parcel shelf off the back. You've got to throw it on the back seat or leave it at home. So you ought to have kind of thought about that really, because that comes off there and it stores underneath the boot floor. So there you go. Well done, Toyota. Very thoughtful. So, not the biggest boot in its class, but a very usable one, and probably enough for 99% of people's use. Rear seat accommodation. Right. Well, again, like the boot, there's better cars in the class. There's a lot worse cars in the class. It's okay, in fairness, depending, obviously, on the type of passengers you'll be carrying back here. The one thing I will say is, it's a dedicated platform, this. So this is Toyota's new platform, and it's been developed alongside Subaru as their technical partner. Now, those companies have shared cars before, the GT86 um, sports car and the, the BRZ, and obviously the new GR86 and the new BRZ, which we are not getting. But this is another car where they've teamed up together, and Subaru give us the Solterra, which is a car that we're going to be road testing soon as well. But as I say, it's, it's a new dedicated platform um, that they're using, so it's not converted from, say, like a RAV4 or something. Um, but even so, what it feels like is the floor is pushed up a little bit. That's the only thing I will say. So you do tend to feel like your, your, your legs are forced up a little bit. And the other thing as well is, depending obviously where the driver or passenger would have the seat, will also depend on whether or not you can get your feet underneath the front seats. I'm struggling a little bit, but I do have my seat set quite low. Um, first of all, because that's how I like it, and second of all, we'll see when we go in the front, the driving position is a little bit weird in some respects. But other than that, actually, there's quite a decent amount of room back here. Now, this particular car is not fitted with the panoramic sunroof, and we'll go on to trims and specs and the pricing section. But I've got decent headroom. So, whereas in some cars you feel that kind of sloping rear end, um, you, you, you're kind of then sort of like limited with headroom, certainly if you're over sort of like my height, if you're crouching on the six foot part, you're no, you don't find that in the BZ4X. It's, it's got a good amount of headroom. The seats themselves are quite a nice shape. The only thing I will say is the central one feels the backrest is a little bit more pushed out. So it's great for the two outer passengers. If you've got a third passenger in the back and the center, it's maybe not so ideal on the backrest. The bench is nice and flat though, and you do get a flat floor right across as well. So there's plenty of foot room for them. Storage is all right. You've got mat pockets on the backs of both seats. You've got decent sized door bins uh, shaped for water bottles. They're not lined though, so they'll kind of rattle around a little bit. You've got a, a flip down armrest, which gives you the um, two cup holders and a little slot in here for maybe say, I don't know, like a mobile phone or a tablet or something. There's no load through facility um, in the center. So if you're carrying sort of longer loads, 
that there isn't a load through with that. So that's maybe a bit of a, a downside there. Connectivity wise, well, yes, you get two USB-C sockets in the back and there's two face vents, although there isn't any rear climate controls um, for rear passengers. So as I say, it, it, again, like the boot, it's sort of middle of the class in terms of rear seat accommodation. And if it's just basically children that's going to be back here, then certainly they're not going to be suffering. Adults are fine, even on slightly longer journeys, but just watch that footroom, depending obviously where you've got the front seat set. Now, if you have watched a Nissan Aria review, and I said to you the interior of that was very un -Nissan like and it's a little bit the same in here. It is a little bit of a departure for Toyota. Um, and I'll, I'll go in to explain a lot more about this sort of console in a second. But the first thing I want to talk about is when I was in the back there, I was saying about the awkward kind of driving position. Let me just sort of explain. So this is the sort of like the main focus of your attention here, this driver's binnacle, which is set right back um, at the sort of like the base of the windscreen and quite high up. Now the reason for that is Toyota are going to offer this a bit like Lexus, are, sorry, a bit like um, uh, Tesla are going to do with a sort of yoke style steering wheel. I don't know why because we've been using round wheels for ages and they work. So I don't understand why we have to literally reinvent the wheel. But that's the reason for it. It's going to have a sort of yoke style wheel. So you won't have this upper section and you've got this view forward into this binnacle. And it sort of works. But when you're sitting there, you've got to have the wheel quite low because then you're able to see over the top of it. Now, it's quite a small steering wheel anyway. Um, and it's not a particularly attractive wheel, um, but I'll talk about that in a second. But as I say, it's a bit like the Peugeot. They're wanting you to kind of look over the top of the wheel and into that binnacle, which as I say is mounted up there. It's in a good position because it's like it's a head up display and there's a good amount of information on it as well. And you can tailor it, you can configure it. There are other ways, you know, you can, you can um, change the view that you get. You can change what you're actually seeing on it as well. So you can have your audio source, uh, trip computer um, settings. You go in there to turn all your um, drive assistance packages off um, or on, depending on your thought as well. Or you can have your media um, up on there. Or you can just go back to having it more of a just a central display. But it's got enough information on it. And as I say, it's nice that it's in your line of sight because I say it's like a head up display. The downside is, as I say, the steering wheel. Now, I tend to sit quite low in a car which then means I've got to lower the steering wheel even more so that I can actually see the binnacle. So it's a slightly weird driving position for me. It's not ideal for me personally. So if you are looking at a BZ4X, then it's something I would suggest, you know, take it for a longer test drive and see how you get on with that because you will have to adapt possibly your driving position um, because of this sort of like layout of the wheel and instrument binnacle. Right, that's the only kind of awkward bit in, in, in the way this is actually set up. I quite like it. All the other cars in the class, because of their sort of like dashboard setup, you get a clear view of the base of the windscreen. You don't with the Toyota because that's mounted slightly high, so you, you can't quite see the whole screen. The base of the windscreen is, um, you're still interrupted by that. But it's no different to normal cars where you've got an instrument binnacle, it's just pushed further away from you. So I wouldn't call it a deal breaker um, from that point of view. Let's move on to this part here because um, this is uh, this is an area of uh, again which is a, a big change and a big departure for Toyota is this infotainment screen. Now, depending on the trim level you get will depend on uh, the, the 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 size of the screen. If you go for the base level pure, then it's an eight inch display, so it's a much smaller screen than this. This is a, a you get and you go up to a motion. Uh, trim this is a vision so the next one up and then you've got the premier edition of course because that seems to be what everyone calls them these days um at the top and that's a 12.3 inch display so it's a much better display than you get in the base model so i'd probably suggest find the extra cash have a rummage down the back of your sofa and don't go for the pure because the eight inch display looks a bit lost there the big 12.3 inch is much better in there the other thing you don't get 
with the eight inch display is embedded sat nav, although you do get wireless Apple CarPlay and wired Android Auto for some reason. Um, so obviously you still would have navigation if you were using Google Maps or Waze, for instance. Um, but if you're reliant on the actual manufacturer's nav, you don't get it on the base model. It's only when you move up. And it's all right. The clarity is pretty decent and the graphics are better. They're better than the Nissan Aria is. That was the one criticism I had of the Aria screen was the graphics weren't as sharp as I wanted them to be. And this is very different to the likes of the system that was used on the Lexus UX 300e, which felt very less last generation. So it's a lot sharper and a lot clearer than the Lexus have used on that. Now, just talking to Lexus, Lexus themselves will do a version of this car called the RZ450e. Um, we had a sneak peek at that or a sneak preview of it at the Goodwood Festival of Speed last year. So if you want to see that, then if you go onto a Goodwood Festival of Speed video from 2022, um, then you'll see the Lexus version of that in there. And that's going to be coming up around about late 2023. I think we should see that car. Moving further down, um, you've got your climate control system here. So again, it's always on. It's a bit like the Kia system, although the, the, the gra it doesn't change functionality. But it's nice, although it's touch sensitive buttons, um, they do actually, they're always on. So and again, you've got some physical controls here to adjust your temperature um, and adjust um, your fan speed on this side here. Um, obviously, you can uh, 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 change the, um, the fan on that one and this rocker switch will change the directional flow of the aircon itself and then obviously you can sync them both up. Um, again depending on trim level depend on the, uh, the equipment level that you have this vision model has a heated steering wheel heated seats and ventilated seats um, too so that's pretty decent but it's nice you've got nice clear um, view of the aircon controls again the graphics are nice and simple um, the, the buttons are nice and physical and the ones that aren't they're nice and easy to hit and you do get that little beep when you press them so when you're driving on the, uh, when you're driving on on the move you know you've touched the right button so that's decent as well and um, moving down here you've got your gear selection um, sort of like dial here so as you you push it down and twist it um, to select whether it's reverse neutral or drive we'll park there and then you've got the buttons on either side of that which again nice the physical buttons electronic park brake um, brake regen which we'll talk about when we're driving it and then uh, the auto hold function on this side you've got parking function your surround view camera your mode selection now interestingly um, and again, we will discuss it more later. You don't get um, the different driving modes really with the BZ4X or the Solterra, um, but you do get the dual motor, an all-wheel, uh, uh, an X mode as they call it, for altering the, the traction of the all-wheel drive system. So that's interesting and we'll discuss that. Um, and then obviously use your, your traction control system there. Right, you've got a wireless charging pad again depending obviously on the trim level you had and it's hidden under this cover which is quite nice because it's it's it, you can see through it you can see your phone when it's on there and there's a usb port there as well for connectivity the only downside for me is this liberal use of this shiny piano black plastic again which two things are really annoying me about it one it shows up every bit of dust and every single fingerprint um, that you can do and this area here on this car this press car this press car's done what 2900 miles and this cover's all scratched just looks a bit i don't know toyota other manufacturers we really need to think about ditching piano black it's done get rid of it now and that's another little bit of my gripe with the interior of the toyota whilst it is a really nice design. I like the fact they've been a bit more avant-garde with the design of it, with this weird kind of binnacle and this big standout screen. And whilst it is very well built, the quality of the materials, I'm questioning. This plastic just doesn't feel that nice. It's a bit rough there. You know, some of the plastics on top of the door, they're a bit hard. Um, same down in the console here. It's, you know, it's just a... It just feels like, as I say, it feels like it'll last forever because it's built by Toyota and they're renowned for that. But it's just the choice of materials I don't particularly like. And it all feels a bit grey and a bit dull in here. Um, it's the same with the seats. This has got the synthetic leather. You don't get um, the option of, sort of like normal leather on the car. It's the synthetic stuff, which just kind of feels, I don't know, it just feels a bit, too vinyl like for my 
lichens. I'm grateful that it has ventilated seats because my overriding memory of vinyl seats was as a wee boy sitting in the back of my dad's Mark III Cortina in a pair of shorts in the summer in Scotland, which we did get back then um, and trying to peel your skin off the vinyl as you got out of it so I'm glad this has got ventilated seats in it because that's what you would need it just doesn't feel particularly plush or special the only saving grace is this kind of material that they've put up on the dashboard here which is wonderful and I like that but a could they not have done it in different color and b why not use that on the seats as well why do we have to imitate leather use something else let's be bold and interesting let's try different things so that's my only kind of gripe about this it just feels a bit i don't know the design's very modern the execution's good but it's just what they've made it out of just doesn't feel particularly great i just wish they'd done something a bit different anyway there we go uh, storage storage is all right um you, you can get my big my big coffee flask and my big water bottle and the two cup holders here. This will slide forward to cover that if you don't want it. There's a little tray in there as well. Um, this does lift up, he says. There we go. Gives you a, a relatively decent bin in there for hiding things in as well, like sunglasses. Um, um, but there's no glove box. No glove box at all. Don't know why. There's no glove box on the car whatsoever. Um, you've got under storage here under this floating console. So there's plenty of storage there. And again, good sized door bins with shaped areas for water bottles. But again, they're not lined. And this is what I mean. It just all feels a bit plasticky and a bit, as I say, it doesn't rattle. It doesn't squeak. It feels solid but it's just the use of the plastic. I don't really like it. And it feels all gloomy and a bit drab and a bit dreech as we would say in Scotland in here um the driving position okay well we'll talk about that a little bit more because they say I think this is a really ugly looking steering wheel I don't like it at all it's just weird um you've got this little airbag kind of thing here that kind of protrudes out nice layout of the buttons you know they're nice and easy to get so you've got your kind of your cruise control on this side here and then your, your audio selection here, you know, for moving up and down the volume, your, your voice recognition, your mo uh, Bluetooth, your phone, and then for changing your display. So that's nice. And then the column stocks, well, they're nice and easy to hand and they've, they've got a nice solid click to them. So that feels good. There's a little thing here in front of you in, in this binnacle, which is a, a, a driver monitor as well. So that's monitoring you. And I think this is moving on to when they start to do something, some level of autonomy where that will monitor whether or not your eyes are actually on the road or whether you're being distracted by things and it will give you a wee warning up there. And that's the other thing. There's an awful lot of beeps and bongs in the car um, as you're driving along and I'm not quite sure about all of that. The instrument panel display, like I said, has enough information on it for you. Uh, certainly got enough for me. My only criticism of that is the battery gauge um, which is on this side here i don't know why it annoys me as much as it does but it does it doesn't have a percentage on it all it shows is how many miles i've got left and then obviously the bar will light up or, or degrade depending obviously on the battery moves but normally in a car you'd say you've got you know i don't know if 113 miles is 80 percent of the battery or 30 percent of the battery or 70 percent of the battery i don't know it'd be nice to have a little percentage display there as well um i know you don't get it on petrol cars or diesel cars to have a percentage of the fuel tank but it'd be nice just to have it there like its rivals have um what else well it's relatively well equipped to standard so as i say if you move away from that base model pure you get the big 12 inch um display uh, heated seats uh, apple carplay android auto as i say um you move into the, the 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 vision and the premier edition you get these synthetic leather seats um which are uh, heated and ventilated you get the heated steering wheel obviously a climate control um there's a plethora of driving aids as well so lane keep assist um the radar guided cruise control distance guided cruise control parking assist as well there's another interesting one as well so as well as blind spot monitoring you've also got um, a thing whereas if you open the door and there's like a bike going past you it'll pick it up and warn you to not open your door as the bike goes past so that's quite interesting as well 
um, and quite handy, especially if you're in and around London, where you've got a lot of bike couriers and mopeds whizzing past you, so that's okay. So that's all good. And then on the door, well, you've just got your usual sort of like, you know, your window controls, your locking and your mirror controls and the memory buttons for the seats. So on the whole, it's good. It's, it's, it's got what you expect it to have. Um, it feels like it will last forever. Um, but my the two things that I, I mean, you have to get used to that wee driving position change. So that's one thing to to take it over first. But the only thing that I will say is I'd like to have seen different materials used because they just don't feel as quality as I would have expected from Toyota. And data suggest they don't feel of the quality that you would expect at this price point, given the competition that's also out there. So mixed bag, good in some areas not so good in others. Okay, let's talk about how the car looks on the outside now. And I have to say, I like it. It's bold, it's bit, it's different for, for Toyota, and I really like what they've done with it. Um, there's a couple of bits that I'm not so sure of, um, which I'll talk about in just a second, but the, the front of it is the most kind of glaringly sort of like different part of it. Now, obviously, you don't need a grill, because you don't need any cooling, so it's got this kind of really kind of sharp kind of nose that it comes to in this big kind of blank area here. Obviously you've got things like your camera for your radar guided cruise control and your driver monitoring assistance down in there, parking sensors and cooling down at the bottom. And you've got some nice kind of vents that go around the side here. But that's where you get this kind of grey cladding. Now it's very much an SUV, it looks that way. And the fact that you can get it with all wheel drive and those driver kind of modes. I think Toyota and Subaru, because it was Subaru who developed the all-wheel drive system for the car, they're going after sort of like traditional customers that maybe have had a RAV4 or a, a Subaru Forester that maybe live in areas like this in the countryside and they need that all-wheel drive. And if you are like that and you're going down the country lanes and the farm tracks, you're going to want practicality. You're going to want big bits of plastic and not painted metal that'll take all the scratches and stuff. That's a good thing, I think, and I like it. I like the fact that they've really styled it like an SUV and not some kind of pretend crossover style. So kudos to the guys for that. These really sharp headlights in here, we you get daytime running light along here, and then your bulbs are in there for the actual driving lamps itself. This is the bit I don't like, however, and when we review the Subaru, you'll see that I think they've done a better job of the styling. It's this plastic kind of eyebrow here and it just looks like the, the panel gap's wrong. It looks like it's fallen away and the bonnet's not shut right at this side. I can't not see that. I don't know why they've bothered putting these body coloured eyebrows on top of the headlights. I don't like it. I think it looks rubbish. The Subaru doesn't have it. And the Subaru's got a slightly different front end to this. And it's a much better execution of styling in my views. That is a load of rubbish. Toyota, facelift time, get rid of them. There's nothing under the bonnet. There's no storage under the bonnet. You can open it, but all you'll see is the heating and ventilation controls. And obviously on the four-wheel drive model like this one, you've got a motor underneath that. You've got the contrast kind of black panel here, and obviously you've got the gloss black roof rails and door mirrors to match up with the side panels as well. And it's around the side where you really see that kind of plastic cladding, which as I say, I like, I don't dislike it at all. And it's practical. And I think it's a good thing to have. I don't even mind the fact that it cuts through the charging flap. What I do mind, however, is this big, bold electric badge on it. Now, the Subaru doesn't do, doesn't get away with it either. It's got EV on there. Why do we need that? Why do we need to tell people that it's electric? I know it's an electric car. I know that's where I charge it. I don't need a badge to remind me, Toyota. Take it off. It's ridiculous. Anyway, there we go. Look at the creases and the kind of sharp lines going down it. Really, really nice. And the whole thing's a kind of really kind of rakish kind of profile. It's really sharp back to it and it's kind of integrated rear spoiler and these wraparound lights, which I think look excellent, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, privacy glass again on sort of like on this model here, again down at the bottom, practical, nice big bit of black plastic down there if you're opening it up against a curb or something, that'll hit it rather than your paintwork. Um, 18 inch wheels are standard on the base model. Um, as I say this go, they go up to 20 inch wheels, which are on this vision model, and it's two, three, five. What did I say? 235-50 R20 Bridgestones that's fitted to the car to stand and it gives it excellent grip and good traction even on the front wheel drive model, let alone this all wheel drive one. So successful design so far. Finished off round the back, 
with again a nice piece of design your obligatory light bar that goes across and see it splits into these kind of two bits here i really like the way they've got these kind of the little kind of grid kind of patterns the line bits quite kind of 80s almost kind of that kind of retro look that toyota kind of went for that kind of 1980s look in there and i like that i think that's really cool get this kind of nice little integrated rear spoiler just at the base of the rear screen and then this weird kind of roof treatment where you've got the kind of twin spoilers one either side a bit like the mg4 and it's top of the range guys has um which is good but of course that means the biggest bugbear of them all it doesn't have a rear wiper what on earth are people playing at? Put a rear bloody wiper on it, for God's sake. And I don't mean to offend people who keep writing to me and saying, but you've got cameras. I know you've got cameras. But in the morning, when you're getting out and it's just defrosted, I want to clear the rear screen. So please, can we just go back to having wipers? I'm not going to say any more about it. I've said enough. But it doesn't have one. There we go. Uh, what else have we got? We've got the little camera mounted up in there, which is nice. It's, it's not in the dot line that's there. You've got obviously a boot release underneath there. Nice build Toyota badge. And again, practical big plastic rear bumper. Integrated reverse and sensors there, and then just your BZ4X and your all-wheel drive. If you're wondering about the name, by the way, the BZ4X and how it's slightly different, let me explain. BZ is Toyota's new kind of electric sub-brand, beyond zero effectively, it means beyond zero emissions. The 4 is for the size of car that it is, so mid-size crossover, like a RAV4 size of car, and then the X is the crossover bit. So that's what the name means, BZ4X. Daft I know, but that's what it is. Anyway. What do you think? Am I right? Is this a good looking car? Is it a good looking Toyota? As I say, I do prefer the look of the Subaru and you'll see that when we do the road test review on the Solterra. But what do you think of the BZ4X? Radical? Bit gawky looking? As always, let us know in the comments down below. Now, whilst you get the choice of a single or dual motor car, there's only one size of battery available and that's a 71 kilowatt hour battery so you do get a variety of different ranges quoted depending obviously on the car or the bz4x that you choose so for instance if it was a pure um, single motor uh, car on the, the 18 inch wheels then toyota quote a wltp range of 317 miles if you go for an all-wheel drive car with the bigger wheels like this one that plunges down to 257 miles there's a middle ground so a single motor car with um, the bigger wheels at 277 uh, miles now that's all WLTP figures, but I was looking on the EV database website, which is quite a good place to look at if you want to get sort of like a real world sort of analysis of what these cars actually will do. And they reckon, depending obviously going from cold to kind of mild weather, that it's somewhere between its true range is probably going to be somewhere between 175 and 235 miles. Now, I'm filming this in, at the end of January and it's not particularly cold today, it's mild, quite mild today. But even I'm struggling with this car and I've seen reports from other journalists who have had the Toyota and the Subaru as well in terms of what they've been able to achieve in terms of its efficiency. And I'm struggling today to get much above 2.1, 2.2 miles per kilowatt hour, which is not good. So if you think about that, 2.1, 2.2 kilowatt hours on a 70 odd kilowatt hour battery, well that's around about 150, 160 miles, um, give or take a few bits. So it's not ideal, I would say. And I've been doing a mixture of motorway, A roads and town driving and out in the countryside. So not brilliant. Anyway, onwards and upwards. Charging speeds. Well, charging speeds, again, a bit like everything else, it's sort of middle of the class. It's 150 kilowatt um, maximum charging speed that it'll take. So your usual benchmark, 10 to 80%, is achieved in around about 30 minutes. Now, the first cars that were being delivered um, only came with an onboard 6.6 um, .6 kilowatt charger. They're now going to come from cars built from, I think it's quarter four 2022, beginning of 2023, are going to have 11 kilowatt onboard chargers fitted to them as standard. So obviously that's going to help it a little bit. And a heat pump is standard on the car as well. So do take that into consideration when we're doing the pricing section too. If you're charging up from your 7 kilowatt home wall box, then you're going from flat to full in around about 11 hours. Now driving the BZ4X, once you get past that sort of slightly kind of quirky driving position, soon becomes quite a nice, easy and dare I suggest pleasant experience. 
Um, on the whole, and again, it will depend obviously on what you're looking for when it comes to this style of car. Now, as I say, there's plenty of choice out there for you if you're looking for this kind of mid-sized crossover SUV style of car. Um, does the Toyota kind of stand out in any way? Yes, but maybe not in the way that you might think. So let's talk about power first of all. You've got a choice of uh, two motors depending on two cars, depending on what you want. So there's either a single motor front wheel drive car that produces 201 brake horsepower, and that does a not to 60 time of around about seven and a half seconds. So bang on what I think is what the, the sort of acceptable um, performance level for this style of car. I don't think you need anything really faster than that, if I'm completely honest with you. But if you go for the all-wheel drive, the dual motor car like this one, the power only increases up to 215 brake horsepower. Now, most of the time when a manufacturer fits uh, twin motors on a car, it, it essentially almost doubles the power. But, and I suspect there's a bit more to do with Subaru than Toyota in this part, because it was Subaru that developed the all-wheel drive system. And given that Subaru are a bit more of that kind of off-roady style of car, they're not really, ch despite having things like the Impreza Turbo and the WRX in the, the, the back catalogue, I suspect they've probably gone down, gone down more of the route of making it feel like, more like a, just a good SUV. And that's the bit where I think this car kind of stands out a little bit from the competition. Its on-road manners are perfectly good, perfectly acceptable, but its off-road manners, I suspect, are the ones where it will really, really shine, and that's with the all-wheel drive car. Now, if you do go for the dual motor car, you're not to 60 time drops, um, only half a second down to about six and a half seconds. But I tell you what, it feels faster than the numbers suggest. I mean, pulling out of that, that junction there, it's got quite a nice level of power delivery. Um, it feels faster, as I say, than the numbers might lead you to think. Another nice thing I quite like about the car is you don't get a whole host of driving modes to try and make the car behave in a way that it's not wanting to. So you don't get, you do get the eco mode um, where it kind of dulls things down and, and, and gets you that the kind of last bit of mileage out of it, which as we'll see in a second, you may need. Um, but you don't get a sport mode, for instance. That sets it's either eco mode or it's normal. And I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm really cool with that. I don't have a problem with it. What you do get on the dual motor car, however, is driving modes for off-road. And it's a button down here called X mode. And if I press that, I can go into deep snow and mud. Um, X mode unavailable because I'm exceeding the, the speed range. Okay, fair enough. So I've got to be at a much lower speed than I'm doing at the moment. Um, but basically, it will distribute the torque differently. Um, as I say, if you're going through deep mud or in snow, or you know, so like let's say a farm track, or, or, or you had like a particularly um, rutted road that you're going down. It's one of the only cars um, where the press pack has departure and approach angles quoted in it. I've never seen that on any other of this style of car from any press manufacturer, from any manufacturer in the press pack. Maybe I haven't read them hard enough, but it really caught my eye that they've got approach and departure angles and wading depth for the Toyota, and then subsequently the Subaru as well. So that's interesting and will tell you a lot of what you need to know. Um, the driving manners on the road, it's slightly, dare I suggest, typical Toyota in the sense that it's a real kind of vanilla style of car. It's nice and refined, it's very quiet. Um, coming down to where I shoot um, these videos uh, during the week, I come along a section of the M25 by me that is notoriously bad and its road surface, and it coped really well with it. You get the patter-patter um, from the wheels as you go over those transverse ridges, as you would expect, but it's not uncomfortable. It doesn't intrude too much into the cabin, so it's relatively refined. There's a relative lack of wind noise as well, um, which again is a, a real Toyota slash Lexus trait, um, so that's really quite interesting. Where it kind of just is a bit more of the kind of vanilla style I was saying about, is maybe in its steering. Now, Toyota are going to offer this car with a yoke style steering wheel at Tesla. 
as I said before, I don't know why. There's nothing wrong with my steering wheel. Don't try and reinvent the wheel as far as I'm concerned. But it will then come with um, fly-by-wire steering, which I think I'm right in saying will be the only car that's available with that. Now, whilst this particular car has a rack and pinion setup, it does have electric power steering, and I suspect it's a lot to do with engineering, getting ready for that yoke system. Now, a lot of cars have electric power steering. They've had them for years. But the BZ4X just feels a bit vague to me. It's not overtly light. It's not too heavy. It just feels vague. It just... you. The wheel's turning more than the car's moving, if that makes sense. It's not direct enough. It's not sharp. And as I say, whilst I appreciate, you know, throwing these cars down twisty roads is not really the main reason for buying a family crossover, I still spend 50 odd thousand pounds on one. I still want to enjoy the drive a little bit, maybe if I'm in the car myself. And I just find the BZ4X a bit vague that's all that's what I'll say on that so it kind of let down a little bit by that steering it, there's just not enough feel there's not enough feedback for me and if you drive something like a Kia EV6 in its uh, GT Line all-wheel drive version and then drive this you'll understand the difference because that's a really quite a pin sharp car the dynamics of the EV6 are really quite something special um, and this isn't quite there with that now, I've just braked for a set of traffic lights, so it's um, probably a good time to talk about the brakes. They're good. They're all right. I quite like the pedal feel. And again, like the driving modes, Toyota haven't felt the need to furnish you with loads of different levels of brake regen. They've gone down the sort of Porsche route that they have with the Taycan. So in other words, it's on or it's off. So when you're on a road and you lift off, you've got that coast... Um, where the car just coasts along, which is good um, because obviously it means you're not fighting against the brakes and it's, it's supposed to be more efficient. <laughs> but you can switch it on. Um, you've got this uh, brake, uh, this button here where it looks like a brake pedal, be impressed. And you really feel the car draw back when you press it, so you've really got to fight against it. Now it's not one pedal driving, not even close to that, but it's possibly enough where it will just give you that little bit of regen, especially around about town. But Toyota's sort of like argument for it, as much as we're moving more towards autonomy and things, I think they're being a bit like, as I say, Porsche, where they're sort of like saying, well, you're still driving it, you're still going to do something. Um, and that's what they seem to have done with that. So I quite like... I quite like that. I'm quite happy with the fact that it's there. You've got another button next to it, the hold button. So in other words, auto hold. So if you stop at a set of traffic lights, it will hold it on the brake. But as I say, it won't stop it on the brake of its own accord. You've got to do it. Um, suspension. Well, as I say, it, it's relatively comfortable. You, you can hear the pitter-patter of uh, harsher expansion joints. The bigger 20-inch wheels of this car quite like to drive one in the 18s to see if there is much of a difference between it. Um, it's not harsh, uh, it doesn't crash through bumps, it's perfectly acceptable, it's no different, um, no worse, it's certainly nowhere near as bad as a Tesla Model Y in terms of its harshness, um, but as I say it's maybe just lacking a little bit of the, um, you know, some of the other cars in the class like the Hyundai Ionic 5, uh, the EV6. Um, it's maybe lacking just a little bit of the tactility of the suspension of those cars. But, yeah, it's all right. It's pretty decent. I'll give it that. The, the, the only thing really to kind of continue on with um, how the car feels to drive, as I say, as I mentioned, it's that driving position. You've kind of just got to get used to it. Once you are, it's fine. It's not weird. It's not, or it's, it is weird at start. Um, the fact is, see, you're kind of looking over the wheel, but if you've if you've driven like, like so the Peugeot E2008 or the little E28, it's exactly the same. You're just kind of looking over. But as I say, if you're like me and you like your seat quite far down, you've really got to alter the wheel maybe into a position where it's just a bit too low. I think the wheel, I've got the wheel a bit too low, but if I have it any higher, it will obscure the instruments for me, and, well, that's not good. Other than that, there's not really a lot to talk about 
except for the efficiency, or dare I suggest, the lack of. Now, I've been driving this car for a little while now, and as I say, I've been driving it on all sorts of different types of roads, and I've been setting my, I set the trip computer to see what I would get from it. And I'm averaging 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour at the moment. Now that's not good. But the worst aspect is this. At the moment, I've got the aircon off. And the rain's showing as 106 miles that I've got left. If I put the aircon on, that drops to less than 80 miles. Now I like, I tend to drive with the aircon on all the time but it's absolutely eating into the range. The other day, it lost 40 miles by putting the air conditioning on. That's not good. I'm really sorry. And all the time I've been doing this job, I don't think I've ever had a car as bad as that. I mean, that is poor. I'm really sorry, but come on, Toyota, and subsequently Subaru. That needs to be better. You can't go around without your heating and ventilation on just to save yourself some miles. And I'm not driving it particularly hard. You know, I've been driving along, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, um, you know, 30 miles an hour around about town. I'm not caning it. 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour, and I'm losing 40 miles by flicking the aircon on. Oh, that's a problem, I think. You're gonna to need to watch that if you're looking at one of these. Handling wise, well, as I said earlier, if you take away the vague steering, it's all right. There's a good level of grip from the car. Um, that's the other thing. And I know I've got the all wheel drive car here. Um, so, you know, in this country where you've got, you know, sort of like, you know a lot of, sort of like bad weather, uh, especially around about where I am, you've got a lot of, sort of like leaves on the road, a lot of, a lot of mud from sort of like, you know, tractors and um, farm machinery going along or builder lorries like the one behind me. It's dropping a pile of mud and stuff on the floor. The all-wheel drive car might be worthy of a consideration if that's where you are um, looking at. Now, I see a lot of people think, you know, SUVs, ah, you do, do you really need a big SUV? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes all you need is a good set of winter tyres on them. But I don't know, and I think, as I say, Subaru and Toyota might be onto something with this. Um, and it's marketing more towards that off-roady type. Whereas the other cars in its class, they tend to stay away from that. They tend to talk more about sort of like on-road dynamics and roundabout town. It's quite nice to see somebody like Toyota and, and Subaru talking about something different. Um, and that translates well when you're out on the road as well because there's a good level of grip from the car. You never feel like it's going to overcome itself. A bit like the, like the Tesla does, there's almost so much power, it feels uncontrollable. This never feels like that. This never feels like you're carrying too much speed into a corner and it's not going to cope with it. It feels like it will cope with it admirably well. And that's a real big boon when it comes to safety. Um, when it comes to that sort of like safety element of how the car actually handles and how it's set up. And that's what I do like about it. I just wish the steering wasn't quite as vague as it was, because um, otherwise you'd, you'd have quite a decent steer in this car. Um, but as it is, it's, as I said at the start, quite vanilla, quite middle of the road. If that's your bag, this could be your car. So, what will you need to find if you fancy one of these. Well, in terms of its price, it's again, fairly much middle of the class and it's very competitive with what else is actually competing with. So the range starts with a single motor pure trim level and that's at 45,710 pounds. And it tops out with the all wheel drive dual motor Premier Edition at £55,710. The car I have here is a sort of, sort of like not quite the top of the range, but almost a vision model with the dual motor setup. And this car is fitted with the one option, which is metallic paint, and that comes in at £54,410. Now, those prices are correct at time of filming, but obviously, as we would always say, please do check your local Toyota dealer or the website, uh, Toyota's website, for up to date pricing, depending obviously on when you're watching this video. Servicing. Well, servicing's every 10,000 miles or annually, and Toyota offer the BZ4X with a three-year warranty, which at first doesn't sound very competitive. 
until you understand this, if you service your Toyota at a Toyota dealership annually, like they're asking you to do, they'll extend that warranty year on year, up to a maximum of 10 years. So in other words, if you continue to use your local Toyota dealership for servicing your new BZ4X, you're pretty much covered for 10 years on the car, which is very competitive indeed. In competition, well, <laughs> are you sitting comfortably? Let's start. I mean, the biggest competitor that this car is going to have is obviously from its technical partner, the Subaru Solterra, as I say, which we're going to be road testing as well in a few weeks' time. But this marketplace is just awash with cars at the moment. Obviously, the other week we had the Nissan Aria, which is another new car straight into the heartland of this sort of mid-size SUV crossover. And as I said, there's things like the Ford Mustang Mach-E, uh, the Volvo XC40 Recharge, the C40 Recharge as well, the coupe-like one, everything that under the Volkswagen brand umbrella, so the ID4, the ID5, the Enyaq in standard and coupe form as well. Q4 from Audi, the Q4 e-tron, both in standard and sportback. Uh, BMW iX1, Mercedes-Benz EQA, uh, Tesla Model Y, uh, what am I missing? Oh, of course, a Hyundai with the Ionic 5 and Kia with the EV6. Now, as I said as well earlier in the video, Lexus as well, they're going to be bringing their own version of the BZ4X out called the RZ450e, which will certainly try to compete with the most like premium type of brands such as BMW and Mercedes and Audi. But as I say, there really is plenty of choice out there. So the world is indeed your oyster. If you've got around about 45 to 55,000 pounds to spend and you want a family-sized crossover that's all electric, it pays your money, you've got plenty of choice. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Toyota BZ4X. We like its styling. The majority of its interior design it drives quite well, there's a good wide choice of trim levels available and there's an excellent after sales package available from Toyota. We don't like the choice of some of the materials for the interior are not worthy of the price. Whilst it does drive well the steering is a little vague and again whilst the boot and rear seat space is average the packaging could be a little bit better but our main issue is that it's not efficient compared with more accomplished rivals in this class. We were supposed to drive the Toyota BZ4X in 2022, but the wheels literally fell off. The Toyota had a bit of an issue uh, with wheel hubs, uh, and therefore all the press um, demonstrations were stopped. Uh, we didn't get a press car that we were supposed to back in, I think it was November time, and we've had to wait until the issue has been resolved, which I'm glad to say has been. And it's meant we've been able to spend a little bit more time with the car, and it's also meant that we've actually been able to hold off until we've driven a few more of its rivals as well. So things like the BMW iX1 and the Nissan Aria, and obviously Skoda's new Enya Coupe as well. If you look across Auto EV, our YouTube channel, this area of the market is probably the one we do the most reviews of. So that 45 to 55,000 pound family crossover slash SUVs, because well, that's what every manufacturer seems to be offering at the moment. So has Toyota done enough to stand apart from everyone else? Well, here's a couple of conclusions for you. What I think they've done is they've offered a proper SUV rather than just a crossover. In other words, if you live in a place like this, if you live in the countryside and you want an all electric car, actually this is pretty, the all wheel drive version is actually pretty good. It's pretty decent. It's one of the only press cars that I've seen in the press pack where it actually mentions departure and approach angles and ground clearance. So that's a big plus in Toyota and obviously now Subaru's um, uh, tick box. The other thing they seem to have done is they've made a, an electric car for Toyota drivers. So if you're coming from something like a RAV4, then this won't scare you at all. A little bit like to, uh, BMW do with their electric product. If you're coming from one of their combustion engine models and you want to move into one of their electric ones, it's not really a scary transition. And this is the same here. As I say, if you've got a RAV4, this will be a very easy move across to you. Yeah, the, some of the plastics aren't as good as Toyota should be but they do still offer an excellent after-sales package and that up to 10 year warranty has got to be a big selling point. However, like I said, this is probably the biggest marketplace that we review cars in. And 
because there's so much good talent out there to get yourself noticed it's no longer good enough to be good you have to be great is the bz4x great i'm not sure it's enough i'm not sure they've done enough it's good but it should be an awful lot better in my opinion thank you for watching yet another road test review on auto ev as always please make sure you are subscribed to the channel once you've done that press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified if when our next video goes live if you've enjoyed the review make sure you do give it a thumbs up and leave us your comments down below as always do you have a bz4x or a solterra or do you have one in order or are you thinking of one then do let us know let us know your thoughts on the car and let us know your thoughts obviously on the channel if you've bought a car um on the basis of one of our reviews as well please let us know there because we certainly do like to know who's bought cars um after watching our reviews it makes us feel all nice warm and fuzzy inside now remember we're across social media platforms too so instagram twitter linkedin facebook so please do give us a follow there because every little bit helps us and if this has just whetted your appetite for even more then trust me stick on our youtube channel because there's now well over 100 videos of road test reviews electric icons twin tests used car reviews even motorbike reviews by our good friend charlie berman just to waste your afternoon away with all that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching and supporting the channel i'll see you again soon